Isn't God good? Not quite time, but almost. Everybody getting quiet on me. Where's everybody at this morning? Got the screaming crowd, but we don't have the the humble crowd. Oh no, no, maybe it maybe y'all are the humble crowd. <laughs> oh, the Lord knows the truth, doesn't He? No matter what we think. Whew. Amen. Well, the pastor told me I needed to wrap up James about a week ago, so. And we can start in chapter 5 today of James. So if y'all want to head that way, you can. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of a good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Good morning, Brother Jeffrey. Good to see you. We're heading over to, to James, the fifth chapter. Amen. We're going to start off by reading the whole chapter, and then we're going to move into topics, or each verse gradually and a little deeper than what the Scripture has maybe we can explain a little bit of what it's really meaning to us. Maybe it's not explaining anything for you. Maybe you already know it all. Maybe there ain't nothing you can do, gain by being all oh, no, you can gain. If all it is is a refreshment for you, you're gaining something brought back to your memory, you're gaining. Verse 1. Chapter 5 of James. Go to now, ye rich men. Weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. My Bible refer references Proverbs 11:28 there. And in Proverbs it tells us that the re rich shall re reward their, receive their just reward, basically. In the first half of that verse. Verse 2 of James, your riches are corrupted, your garments are moth-eaten, your gold and silver is cankered, and the rust of them shall be a witness against you. What does it mean when you got rust in gold? Not pure, very good, very good. Same for silver. At what point did we start purifying gold to the point that we could call it 99.9% .9 pure? They can never tell you it's 100% pure. But it wasn't back when we was having the gold rush in California. There it was never as pure as what we see today or can see today. Again, we're in, in uh, chapter 5 of James. Let's go back to the beginning of verse 3. Your gold and silver is cankered, and the rust of them shall be a witness against you. Witness against you. And shall eat your flesh as it were fire. The rust of them shall eat the flesh. Wow. As a fire. Ye have heaped treasures together for the last days. Behold, the hire of the laborers who have reaped down your fields which is of you kept back by fraud, crieth and cries of them which have reaped are entered into the ears of the Lord of Sabbath. Verse 5, Ye have lived in pleasure on, this, on the earth and been wanton. Ye have nourished your hearts and in a day of slaughter, as in a day of slaughter. Ye have condemned and killed the just, and he doth not resist you. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it, until he received the early and latter rain. 
Be ye also patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Whew, that's good. Grudge not one against another, brother, unless ye be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. Take my brethren, the, the prophets, who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. Behold, we count them happy which endure. Ye have heard the patience of Job and have seen the end of the day, end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. But above all things, my brethren, swear not, neither by heaven, neither by the earth, neither by any other oath. But let your yea be yea, and your nay be nay, lest ye fall into condemnation. Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that ye may be healed. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are. And he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth, and one convert him, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death, and shall hide a multitude of sins. Boy, isn't that good. I thought chapter 4 was really good and really thorough for us and very helpful to us. But so can chapter 5 because it adds a support element. It adds a be patient and wait for the day of the Lord is coming. But it also gives us a little bit of caution. A caution. Now, who, who is this book written to? Chapter 1 told us, remember? It's written to who? Anybody have a guess? The children of Israel that followed Jesus Christ and were scattered abroad. Because of who? those like Saul of Tarsus that went out persecuting the Christians, right? Because many of them were killed or beaten or stoned or whatever, and many of them did not survive this earth because of people like Saul of Tarsus. Amen? Let's look at this scripture a little bit closer. Looking at verse 1 through 3, my outline shows it's a rebuke to the impure rich. The rich and the illusions of wealth, illusions of wealth. What do we often do when we get money in the bank extra and we sit back and we watch it grow and we grow, watch it grow? What do we do? We get a little bit, little bit maybe more reliant on who? Self. And less reliant on who? God. Yeah. Come now, rich people. James developed the idea of the deed to rely entirely on God. 
He is now naturally rebuking those who are very likely to live independently of God and who are rich. Although Jesus counted some rich people among his followers, such as Zacchaeus, Joseph of the Archer, I, I want to call him Joseph of Arimathea, Barnabas, both of those were, or all three of those were known as being fairly well off. We are compelled to note that the rich do indeed provide an additional important obstacle to the kingdom. In Matthew 19 and 23, it talks about the camel going through the eye of the needle. Whether that's a sewing needle or whether it's a gateway inside of Jerusalem does not really matter. It was an obstacle that a camel had trouble if it could at all get through. I read online one time about the eye of the needle of the gates in Jerusalem. As they got closer to the castle and such, they didn't want the livestock up next to, to the, the temple or the castle. And so to prohibit them from going any closer to the center of the, of the town, they built the gates a little bit smaller. Or they opened up a small opening for people to walk through. And it took a special command to get the bigger gate opened. Just so people could come into the courts of, of the palace, but the livestock couldn't come. Now, there's a lot of livestock that could still go through that doorway, couldn't they? A horse is, many horses are not any taller than a man. And that was the height and the width of the doorway was what was much smaller for the eye of the needle, as they called it. It is also true that the pursuit of wealth is a motive for every conceivable sin. Every conceivable sin ties you to desire more wealth. He speaks to them as simply rich. Wealth and grace can come together. But as villains, they not only soaked up in wealth, but misused it for pride, a life of well-being, oppression on the, of the poor, and cruelty. Crimolin, M-O-L-O-L-I-N, Molalin, is a Hebrew word, or maybe it was Greek. I'm sorry, I didn't write that down. James asked the rich in the style of the Old Testament prophets to weep and weep in the light of their fate and their coming misery. Weep, molin, molin, for your coming misery. In the coming life, the evasion of their wealth and wealth that the moths have eaten will be revealed. James is likely referring to the destruction of three types of wealth, food pantries, clothes moth-eaten, bug-eaten, gold and silver, which many of us have trusted in, have rusted and corroded. Wow. Wow. Each of them ends up becoming nothing in its own self, its own way. It is better for you to weep here as in the paupers than, in, than to weep in the afterlife. It's better for you to weep here as there are wipes to wipe away tears in Christ's hands. Christ can wipe away our tears. Then to wipe away eyes in hell. It's better for you to take refuge with humans than to scream with evil spirits. That's who's going to hell, right? Is evil spirits. We know they'll be there. And if we, we were not to make heaven our home, 
we would be there also with them, would we not? It shall be a testimony to you. The corrupt nature of the riches of the rich will be a testimony to them that is against them. Boy, we see that battle going on right now in our news, can't we not? We see Trump talking about going back to the White House. And we see what a hustle there is out there about to, to, to tear him down to where he cannot be a contender. What's right or wrong? Well, Lord knows what's right or wrong. And if we put our trust in the Lord, He will show us the right as well as the wrong. Rich will be a testimony to them that is against them. If we have a bad testimony, is that our testimony? If we are known for doing evil, is it our testimony? But if we are known for being good or doing good or following this or that, which is of God, is that not also our testimony? How we are known by our fellow man, how, by our fellow brother in the Lord, On the day of judgment, it will be revealed that they lived their lives in arrogant independence from God. Something James has previously condemned as they were piling earthly treasures in the last days. While they had to hoard treasures in heaven. Luke 18, 22. I'm going to look at that scripture for a minute. I got them here on my printout. I done passed up the first page of scriptures. Didn't read a one of them to you. Shame on me. For the love of money is the root of all evil. 1 Timothy 6.10. Boy, isn't that good? Luke 18. Did I guess I didn't copy Luke 18. Timothy 6 and 10 tells us too, doesn't it? Oh, I, I didn't get 18. I got 19. Well, 19 is coming. That's the next page in my notes. Y'all like me getting getting a little unorganized for a moment, right? Proving I'm human too. In the last days, depict eternal torment in a very colorful Jewish terms. The same possibility arises for the end as a threat to the rich and a consolation to the poor and oppressed. Now, I don't think there's anybody here that would, would count themselves in the top ten rich people in the United States, huh? I don't think we have y'all here that are there. Well, I, don't, I don't think I ever want to be there. I think I, I flow with David when he said, he, let me just have what's convenient, Lord. Don't make me rich. Yeah. Verse 4 talks about condemnation of the sins of the rich. Behold, the hire of the laborers who have reaped down your fields, which is of you kept back by fraud, crieth, and cries of them which have reaped are entered into the ears of the Lord of Sabbath. Ye have lived in pleasure on the earth and been wanton. Ye have nourished your hearts as in a day of slaughter. You have condemned and killed the just, and he doth not resist you. Behold the fair of the deed. Yeah. Behold the hire of the laborers who have reaped down your fields. Behold the fare of the deed under, underestimated of you. The rich refrain from paying the wages of the deed and lived a liberal, liberated life without regard 
to others. Such as the rich man in Jesus' story of rich men and Lazarus found in Luke 19. That's what I printed out here. Amen. Y'all know that story. I don't need to read it to you, do I? Rich man Lazarus. Pastor referenced it in his lesson, I guess, about a week ago. The rich man and Lazarus. What was the aftermath of that discussion? The aftermath was what? Lazarus was in the bosom of Abraham. And the rich man was in hell, tormented, tormented with fire, tormented. He said, just let it, Father Abraham, just let him dip his finger in a cold drink of water and touch the tip of my tongue. Whew. We as humans know that just a drop of water on the tip of your tongue would not satisfy, would it not? It never does satisfy us just to have a drop of water. I want a whole glassful, don't you, Ken? When I'm parched and, and want something to drink, I get that way where I want to go drink a whole glass of water real quick. Not soda, not tea, not coffee, water. Isn't it amazing that all the things we put in, into water to make it so more desirable doesn't really satisfy us? But when we get back to the natural flow of water, we get that satisfaction. We get that craving of water satisfied. Deferring payment of a kind of fraud is a kind of fraud because it loses the creditor the advantage of improvements. Thus, they are unjustly taxed here in addition to greed since they live on the fatigue of the deed. The harvesters harvested the field but did not reap their, their just reward and starved the poor to enrich the rich. A little money is never satisfying, is it? Many people say, uh, why do you keep working? You can never spend all you have in the bank. Why do you keep on slaving? Why do you keep, why does Trump still want to go back to the White House? How much, how crazy is that? Does he need the money of the, of the wealth that he would get from the White House? Probably not. It probably would never help him again. What is the draw? It's like that drink of water. A drop does not satisfy. But does really a glass of water satisfy? Do you ever want another drink after that day that you get the full glass? How about a pitcher of water? If you drink the whole pitcher of water, will it satisfy you forever? Never. The, the thirst is coming again. And wealth is the same way. What is enough? Where is enough? Thus they are unjustly taxed here, you know, taxed as in, not, not by tax by the government, but taxed as in overworked without repayment for their deeds. Wow. Because of greed. They cry of the harvesters, the cry of the harvesters has entered the ears of the Lord as soldiers. The King James Version uses the, the Lord of Sabbath. The commentary tells me that, that that word Sabbath is just another way of, of saying the Lord of the soldiers. The Lord of the soldiers in in James should not be confused with the similar title Lord of the Armies. 
of the heavenly angels. Oh, I can skip a lot. Lord of the Sabbath. Which means Lord of the armies. There it is. And in particular, the heavenly armies. Using this title was intended to give these oppressors a warning to them. The cries of the people. They suppressed reach. The suppressed cries of the people reached the ears of God. Who leads the heavenly armies? He is the God of power. He is not only the God of power, but also of judgment. The main reference here is to Yahweh the Lord of the soldiers or the Lord of the armies of Israel and later the Lord of the soldiers of heaven. Jewish teachers rarely use this title. I never knew that before. But Exodus 3.6 associates it with Yahweh's war on justice. God's going to lead an army for justice sake. Amen. Amen. This is a repeated designation of God on the Old Testament, and it signifies His uncontrollable power. He could control it, but I couldn't. You couldn't control His power. Many of us think, oh, I can do this, I can do that. And you see things that are unbelievably done. Evil can evil. Everybody remember Him? Always doing the unheard of things. You know, jumping the, the, the gorge that time, you know. Of course, I think that was just a setup, you know. He, he got all that backing and support, and all of a sudden he just didn't make it. He just got over in the middle of the gorge and pop, popped the parachute down to safety. Wow. They said, oh, he saw that he wasn't going to make the distance. Well, that may be the truth. The view was quite different from inside that cockpit, I'm sure, than what it was on the sidelines, don't you think? Yeah. As you are shooting a gun and you watch the bullet in its trajectory, you can tell sometimes where it's going to land, can't you? Is it, that is, if you've got good enough vision to watch the bullet. Now, the bigger the bullet, the easier it is to follow it. Well, maybe not so, as fast as they go out sometimes. Whew. Defending his followers and punishing the wicked. That's what God's going to lead his army to do. You judged the righteous, you killed him, James said. The poor and the powerless in this world often do not get justice that satisfies them. However, God hears their screams, and it is He who ultimately ensures that every mistake is corrected and that every injustice, every injustice, is rewarded. How do you reward an injustice? As a parent, sometimes we see our kids doing injustice things, don't we? And how do we reward them with that one, okay? Pop on the backside, you know? Maybe it just deserves a scolding. Maybe it deserves taking away their favorite thing, whatever it was. But they reap their reward. You judge the bar, you killed him. Wow. A call for patience, probably in the light of the coming judgment. If you know somebody's going to pick up the stick and say, okay, you bad people, come get your whipping, what do you do when you're standing by? If somebody walks up and kicks you on the shin, David, are you saying, boy, I, I deserve that? Maybe you were totally innocent, David. Surely you can only tell us the insight on those things. Maybe you didn't deserve a shin kicking. And the parent comes over and grabs that kid up and says, let me take you for a talking. And before they get out of your sight, they start smacking that bottom a little bit with their hand or whatever. Do we feel 
reprieved? If your shin is still aching, but you see the kid receiving a, a smack on the backside, do you feel like maybe justice has been won? That's what he's saying here. God's going to take care of that for us. Who can spank that person better than God? How many's ever received a spanking from God? Yeah, all of us have probably. Some of us just shy to raise our hand because we're embarrassed that we could ever, ever do something that deserved that kind of reward. Well, we can't think of a reward as being a spanking, huh? But it is. It's our just reward sometimes. It's just what we deserve. The light of the coming judgment. When's the judgment coming? End of times, right? Hopefully after the Lord has pulled us out of this world, we're, we're reigning with Him on high. Verse 7, Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth and hath long patience for it. For it being the precious fruit. We long for it. How many here garden? You can do flowers or you can do produce, something you can consume. Or maybe you eat flowers, I don't know. But either way, if you plant a bed of, of, of seeds for flowers and nothing comes up, what do you do? If it's not too late in the year, you go till it up and do it again, don't you? Plant it again with some different seed because maybe the seed's got bad. Same thing for your garden spot. If you plant a row of beans and you look halfway down the row and it's barren, there's nothing coming out of the ground there. Only one of two things could have happened, the bad seed, or we planted the seed too deep and it couldn't get to the light. Whoa, is that not a spiritual annotation there? If we bury ourselves too deep in the earth and we can't get to the light, does that impact us too? Does it not impair our growth? Ooh, be careful while you plant your seed. until he received the earlier or latter rain. Be also patient. Establish your hearts. I think we use the word establish more. But east means that it's a beginning establishment. And establish means what? That we've already been there, but now we need to re and maybe reestablish is what it's saying here. Whether it's reestablish or establish what, because you've never done it before, we need to do it because for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Whew. With the coming of the Lord, what also is coming? Judgment. The reward will be passed out whether you're good or whether you're bad. Be careful, brothers, James puts before us the final issue of judgment in his remarks about the ungodly rich and their destiny. Do we believe in predestination? Well, I don't believe that I was determined to be saved before I gave my all to God. I don't believe it was predestined for that. But I believe our actions can determine where we're going to go. Do you not? If we never give our heart to God, if we never follow His Word, if we never, we are des destined to what? Hell. If we give ourselves to God, we are determining our future, are we not? Not in this life, but in the next. Not to mention, I just think that a Christian has so much more to live for than a non-believer. Have you ever seen that? How God supplies your needs when you need them? How God supplies 
the rich to the richer? Oh, no, he doesn't do that, does he? They might make more wealth, but is it because God blessed them? I wonder how they spend that wealth. Now, obviously, these three that was mentioned up in the front of the Scripture as being followers of, of Christ, but also having wealth, what about them? We know that they gave their wealth for the furtherance of Christ. Whew. Praise God. It does not turn workers against unjust employers. Rather, they are being asked to leave the unjust rich to take God's imminent revenge on their cruelty. It's not because they're cruel, it's because they have been cruel. Behold, the peasant waits for the precious fruit of the land. Careful about it. The peasant does the peasant does not des despair when he does not reap his crop immediately. but continues to work even when he cannot see the crop at all. When your garden doesn't grow in that row, you go replant it. You still, now I don't know if we'd consider ourselves peasants or not, but I don't consider myself of the rich level either. Believers in Christ must exercise patience, endurance, even when the day of harvest seems too far away. James directs us, we should wait for the Lord and not be afraid to wait, to be patient with it. Charles Spurgeon said, a man who is asked to be careful and promised a reward must keep his courage. Whew. When he is to, has to wait, he says, that's no more than I expected. Wow. Have you ever hit a wall and realized that it's no big deal? We'll just wait on the Lord. That wall will disappear someday. And we'll try again. How many of us knocked a door and been turned down or almost abusive against you? But you patiently kept returning getting your scolding each time you come why are you here don't don't bother me but you patiently wait on the day of the Lord that's what Charles Spurgeon's talking about here Whew. that's no more than I expected I didn't think I was going to kill my enemy from the first strike wow He's referencing a soldier going into battle and the armies are vast and one army soldier does not expect to win that battle if he doesn't have the, the force of those around him, right? Maybe like David and Saul, you know, Saul was chasing him to kill him because of jealousy and other things. And David patiently waited upon the Lord. What a good example for us as Christians. When we have our neighbors and our friends that we like so well, but they just don't want to go to the Lord. They don't want to follow the Lord. We can take and look at David and say, patiently wait. They're not trying to kill us. They just don't, don't want to accept what we have to say. But I kept in mind to wait. Now he that has come, I find that God gives me grace to continue fighting. This is Charles Spurgeon again. And he uses the word jihad. Continue fighting and jihad until victory is achieved. Patience saves man from a lot of haste and foolishness. Charles Spurgeon. When we think about it, waiting and needing patience prospect in the Christian life is much like waiting for a patient or for a peasant. Waiting on the harvest, waiting on the reward of the harvest. 
which sometimes he gets cheated out of. He waits with reasonable hope and expectation of the reward. He waits for a long time sometimes. He waits while he continues to work all the time. He waits relying on things outside his authority and his eyes fixed on the sky. He is waiting despite changing circumstances and many uncertain things. He waits encouraged by the value of the harvest. He waits bravely for the work and the harvest of others. He's waiting because he actually has no other choice. He waits because surrender and despair do him no good. You ever throw your hands up on a job and says, I can't do it? I got Rocky and, and, and Rachel's rototiller in my shop, and I've had it there for a year, almost. And I've, I've done several things to it. But still, because it's just not quite right. Oh, I had it running for what seemed like a long time, but I wasn't satisfied it could till the ground at that, at that level. I'm still not satisfied. I'm through with it. Any day they could say, Keith, just bring it home, please. Any day they could call it out and say, it's not important, just bring it home, I'll get rid of it or whatever. Get somebody else that can, can figure out what you've missed. That's what the difference is, is I've just missed something, Ken. I've missed something or I've got something adjusted just a little out of line, but it just ain't quite what it needs to be. That's just like the Lord. He's sitting there saying, Tony, don't worry about it. It's no big deal. Just continue. Don't give up. Continue. Don't give in to the evil ways of this world. Continue in my ways. Continue when things get tough. Continue when you can't get it tuned up just right. Continue. Keep on going. Don't quit. They can't seem to wait long enough until it gets early. They get the early and the late rain. How many people use a turn and plow in the fall? Nobody here? Okay. How many here has got a turn and plow? Okay. Oh, well, we got one. Okay. Amen. Sometimes we, we need to kill out some weeds during the winter, don't we? Sometimes we allow thorns to grow in our lives, don't we? We allow things to come in, and sometimes we need to revamp our garden space by giving it a good turning in the fall so the winter freezes can kill out the weeds, can kill out the, 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 the thorns. That's how we are with God too, right? Whew. The early rain makes it softer so you can use a turning plow on that ground. If it's hard from the summer heat and bait, that turn and plow makes it so much easier. How many go in and just re, just retill their gardens every year? Yeah, that's what a lot of people do because that's all they got is a, a rototiller. When my neighbor goes in in the fall and he'll use a turn and plow on his garden spot almost every year. And he turns that soil over and lets it set during the winter months and he has some of the prettiest potato buds I've seen. They're not buds, but the, the plant growth comes up. It's so pretty. Whew. And what can we do? Use a turn and plow. Look forward to the early rains for the softening of the soil. What about the latter rains? What does it do for us? The latter rains do what? It nourishes the 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 uh, harvesting part. It fills out the, the plants and, and the tomatoes get really big and when it gets plenty of water. And the squash gets really beautiful when it's got plenty of water. That's with us too. 
Sometimes we need to turn our soil in the fall and let the winter freeze out the evilness that's creeping in around us. Sometimes we need that summer rain to nourish the growth. Amen. Boy, can you not see the Lord in that? Just watching your garden grow, can you not see the Lord in your garden? If you don't raise a garden, can you not see them in your flowers? We've grown citronella almost every year we've lived here. Our front porch, we put planted along our front porch, and we can go out there in the worst day of mosquito season and not get bit. And if they start flying, we just reach over and snap a limb, and the odor just fills the air, and they just leave. Well, my sister had tried that many years earlier before I did, or before we did, I should say. And she had given up on citronella. The other day, I had my cell phone out, and I was talking to her on the phone, and I said, you, would you like a picture of my, our flowers? She says, yeah. She's, she's a flower nut. She loves flowers. And I sent her a picture of, of our, what we call an airplane plant, a spider plant that has just gone crazy this year. It looks beautiful. And then I reached down and I gave her a snapshot of our citronella bed. You know, I've tried a lot of different plants since we moved in over here, and so many of them just died away. I'd water them, I'd spray them with fertilizer, and they still would die away. What's wrong with that? Well, in the citronella bed, we dug it out about 12 inches deep, about two foot, um, um, from front to back was about two foot, and the sides was as long as the front porch went from the sidewalk to the end. And we dug the soil out. Actually, I hired me some boys to do this so you didn't, don't get ideas that you can't do it because you can hire boys too. Hired me some boys to come dig that out. And then I took miracle Grow soil out of the bag and filled that bed up and then started putting my citronella in there. My citronella is about knee, knee high to waist high somewhere in there and just really full right now. Is it because of the rain? Oh, yeah, I'm sure all this rain's helped that. It's made it full and plenteous. Wow. Hidden God good. I, wouldn't you like to brag on your, your plants? In reality, I don't believe it's anything Keith did. I think it's what somebody else did at the factory with miracle Grow soil. And when somebody did, when they planted the seed into the pot, because I bought the plants already bigger, it's what somebody else did that I just adopted. I just took it in. Amen. We can do that with the Lord, can't we? We can adopt His ways. We can adopt His methods, His His thoughts of doing of making things grow of course we're not talking about natural growth as in citronella plants or, or airplane plants we're talking about spiritual things growing we're talking about how can we make our spiritual walk with God grow Whew. be patient verse 8 says establish your hearts if you've already established your heart and you're trying to make your spiritual walk with God better, to grow more, then maybe you need to reestablish. If you've never established, then you need to establish Christ in you because He is our inspiration. He is, our, he is the one that helps us to grow. If we wait upon ourselves, wait on him to, or wait on others. I'm sorry, brother, brother 
Ken, but sometimes Ken might do something that would mislead me because he still has to fight his flesh. Miss Barry is, is a wonderful person. And Brother Ken is a wonderful person in my view. But sometimes they may not walk as Christ would walk. So I can't use them to follow. I can't follow Ken. I've got to follow Christ who was my perfect example and is your perfect example. Amen. And we've got to take that rain when it comes. Why do we need to soften the soil so we can turn the, use the turn and plow? Or why do we just need our harvest to be fuller and fatter because we have got a fresh rain? Wow. The earth is preparation for plowing. The importance of the soil to be soft when we turn that plow. Yeah. And it's also important for the ripening of the fruit for the harvest. We are doing this for the harvest of Jesus Christ, of God Almighty. We are doing the harvest for Him. But we shall reap the benefits of that harvest. That's what we do with our gardens. We reap the benefits if we help it to grow as best we can. If we sit back and do nothing but mow it down when it gets big, what happens? We get nothing. The harvest is nothing. The Bible explains that there will be a great spilling of the Holy Spirit in the last days. We find that in Joel, the second chapter. I want to read that one. Now, it's also referenced in Acts, the second chapter, Joel, Joel 2, 28 and 29. I'm going to back up to 27 there and read through 30. And ye shall know that I am in the midst of Israel and that I am the Lord your God and none else. And my people shall never be ashamed. Verse 28, and it shall come to pass afterwards that I will pour out my spirit upon all. That's A-L-L. -L. One of the biggest words in the world is all. It may not be how many letters, but it is a large, big word, all. That I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. Verse 29, and also upon the servants and upon the handmaids, in those who will I pour out my spirit. No matter who you are, God's going to pour out his spirit upon us if we do not reject it. Each of us could reject Jesus. Eva's, every one of us could reject that spirit pouring out. Verse 30, I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. <laughs> Acts 2 and 17 says, For these are not drunken as you suppose. <laughs> Seeing it is but the third hour of the day, verse 16, for this is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel. Wait a minute. This is Acts 2. Who's talking here? Denial Peter. Wasn't he denying Christ? He did. But he repented of his sins. And God is using him in Acts 2. He's become the spokesman for all the, the apostles in Acts 2. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit of uh, pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Verse 18. And all my servants and all my handmaidens. I will pour out in those days of my spirit and they shall prophesy. 
You may not be a leader. Maybe you're just a servant. That's all I count myself as, is a servant of God. He's still going to pour out his spirit on me as a servant of God. He's still going to pour his, if you think you're just a handmaiden, okay, you guys, you can't be handmaidens, okay? But even if you ladies think of yourself as nothing more than a handmaiden, he's not going to discriminate against you. He's still going to pour out his spirit upon you. Amen. That's the first bell. I could move into verse 9. I probably could finish it. Let me do that. Exercising verse 9 of, of chapter 5 of James. Grudge not one against another. Brother, unless you be condemned, behold, the judge standeth before the door. And the topic of this verse is exercising patience, endurance, endurance among God's people. Doug, be patient with me, okay? I'm just a servant of God. Do not groan at each other. Times of hardship can make us less loving. To our faithful brothers and to our faithful sisters, James reminds us that we cannot condemn others even in times of distress. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. Jesus is coming soon. And he's coming as a judge not only to judge the world, but also to establish the faithfulness of the believers. The believers in Christ, that is. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10 says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. The word all is again used. All. All. That big, giant word, all. All of us will stand before God to determine whether what we have done in our body is good or bad. Good or bad. And only we can determine what that judgment will be. Will your harvest time be joyous? And of good blessings? Or will our harvest time be sad? Will somebody look at, look at you and say, he never told me about Jesus? That's going to come up then. He never walked in my walk, Jesus says. That's going to come up then. He won thousands and thousands of souls to the work of God. That's going to come up then too. Because we're going to receive the blessings of good or the blessings of bad. And it may not feel like much of a blessing if it's bad. God 